Um, so today we are going to be talking about small mammals, as I've mentioned. Um, my details are here if you do have any questions afterwards or you want to be um, signposted to anything. And um, for those of you that are part of the project and um, this forms, you will be getting uh, an email with a list of resources um, for you to go to for future. Uh, we do have hashtags and we are on social media, so please do feel free to post about this webinar uh, throughout social media and spread the word. And um, we are able to do this today thanks to the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the National Lottery Players. Um, so thank you very much if you do play the National Lottery. Um, they are funding our project. And this forms part of our Warwickshire Wildlife Trust 50 years celebrations, which is quite the milestone to have got to. And we're very proud to have grown um, to such an extent here in 2020. Uh, so the first part of the session will be about the ecology and the types of small mammals that you might find in Warwickshire. And then we'll have a little break and then we'll move on to survey methods and field signs for these small mammals. And then we'll have another little break and then we'll look at the threats that our small mammals are facing um, and then ways in which uh, we might be able to help them. and We might be able to actively go out and do things and the, the kind of work that we do here in Warwickshire. Um, and then we'll have a main question session, um, but you can always interject with, with questions if you'd rather at the time. Um, so. To start with, uh, just a brief overview of the project. For those of you that aren't part of the project, you might want to join. Um, so the project is for young adults aged between 18 and 35 years old. Um, the main website is, is listed here in the middle if you do want to check it out or inquire about becoming a volunteer for it. Um, the idea is that you'll get uh, lots of training in conservation and ecology in, in the first year of the programme, which is happening now. Um, and then in the second year of the programme, you'll get lots more training in, um, in terms of communicating uh, what you've learned about conservation um, and marketing and raising awareness so that you can really go out and actively spread the word um, about the causes that you feel strongly about in terms of the environment. Um, you'll also get a chance later on in the project, hopefully to be put in contact with um, and have discussions with some of our long-standing members and volunteers at Warwickshire Wildlife Trust um, as a sort of knowledge exchange um, and get to learn about the things that they campaigned for in the past and were successful in doing. Um, all of the activities are ideally based around your interests and your availability, hence we're holding it tonight when most people are available. Um, so I try and work as much as I can around that. I am your Wilder Future Officer, Debbie. Um, I am here to support you in all your needs. I work full time on this project, uh, so you can get in contact with me anytime with any questions that you might have. Um, so please do utilise me. I am here for your benefit. So, small mammals. Uh, so here is uh, a list of our small mammals that we have in Britain. Um, so this actually comes from the Small Mammal Specialist Group, the IUCN group, uh, of which the, the link is here, just the top one of those links. Um, they're not necessarily all what you would call small, but they have certain characteristics that they use to class them as small mammals. So the ones in black um, are actually non-native species, so we're not going to discuss those too much today. Uh, the ones in green are native species to Britain or are considered pretty much native. Um, and those ones in bold in green are the ones that we find in Warwickshire, so the, we'll be focusing on those tonight. Um, you can also go to the Mammal Society website, which is the middle one listed in here in the links, which is a fantastic website filled with loads of information. Um, it is a charity that you can sign up to, uh, but it's got fact sheets of every single species of mammal that you'll find here in Britain. And um, so that's really useful, lots of field signs, things like that to download for free. Um, there's also Warwickshire Mammal Group that I would recommend checking out their website. And um, that's also got information on your mammals and you can also record your, your mammals that you find locally there. Um, but importantly, uh, there are lots of events, usually not necessarily in COVID-19 that are happening that you can attend um, and sign up for, um, in particular the Dormice and Hedgehog surveying that we'll talk about later. Um, and they might even be doing a digital program of talks later on in the winter, like the back group is at the moment. Um, so do keep an eye on that. So we tend to group our small mammals really into um, the rodents and we've got mice and voles and then we've got our insectivores and largely our shrews. So to start with our mice, um, so I'll talk about the, the different ones that we have. So first up is the wood mouse. So this is your classic looking mouse and um, it's your Mickey Mouse mouse. It's got big ears, big eyes and big feet that it uses to jump around. 
Um, it's also got quite a long tail. It's quite an attractive mouse, the wood mouse. It's got this lovely brown upper coat um, and whitey grey underneath uh, when it's an adult. Um, when it's a juvenile, it's often a lot more grey and more confused with the house mouse that we'll come on to later. You've got the yellow neck mouse, which is not so common at all. We do have that in Warwickshire though, so do look out for it. Um, we generally find them in deciduous forests, um, and this is uh, where they'll, they'll nest and burrow. Uh, they're generally bigger than the wood mouse, even though they look quite similar. Um, and uh, the key characteristic really to tell the difference between them is that they have quite a thick, dark yellow band, um, as you might imagine, from the name across their chest, across their, their upper chest, their neck area. And it really is a, a quite a thick, uh, unbroken dark yellow band that you can see a little bit here. Um, a wood mouse might have a bit of a collar, might have a bit of side yellow bits, but it will be broken up. It won't be that continuous band usually. Then we've got our house mouse, um, which again, as I said, might be confused with wood mice, particularly when the, the wood mice are young. Um, they're a lot more grey, um, a lot more musky looking, less potentially difference between the top and the uh, underneath in terms of colour. Um, they're generally a bit more musky smelling, a bit more greasy, um, and they've got more ratty tails, more scaly tails. Their snout is actually quite a bit more pointed than that of the wood mouse, um, so there are some differences. Habitat wise, um, wood mice uh, tend to overlap with that of house mice sometimes, particularly in fields um, and grasslands. Um, you do find wood mice in woodlands, as you might expect, um, and hedgerows and house mice are traditionally associated with houses, although the overlap is, is quite a lot. Um, and the yellow neck mice, as I mentioned, are generally more found in, in deciduous forest. All of our mice tend to be mostly nocturnal, um, and they've all got these kind of Mickey Mouse ears, the ones that have been mentioned here. So then moving on, we've got the uh, slightly more unusual harvest mouse, which you're much less likely to have seen. Uh, so harvest mice are really quite an attractive mouse. Um, they've got this really russety, orangey, reddy brown uh, fur above, um, and they're quite pale and white below. Um, key characteristic really of the harvest mouse is how small it is. It's usually only about six to eight grams, so it's, it's really, really quite small. Um, it's still got the large eyes, but its ears are quite a bit smaller and hairier, um, and it's got more of a blunt muzzle, which means that it's often confused with bowls. Um, it does have, you know, fairly mousy feet, as you might imagine, but it has quite a cool, uh, slightly opposed thumb, and also what we call a semi-prehensile tail. So this essentially acts a bit like a monkey's tail, like another limb. And both of these latter adaptations are to help it move around in the environment in which it lives, which is usually amongst um, grass stems and other um, materials that sort of stand upright and are quite dense. And um, so uh, this mouse does look quite different to your other mice and it, it does live in potentially slightly different habitats. Uh, we'll have a look at some of those habitats lately. Uh, later, sorry. It is generally crepuscular, so it, it's a dawn and dusk type mouse, um, although it's often out in the night as well, um, just generally not as much in the day. Harvest mice are a bit more in trouble than some of our other mice, uh, so they're estimated to be in about just over half a million in terms of population in Britain. Uh, they're generally a, a southern and, and coastal Wales species. Um, however, these estimates are really, really unreliable because we just don't have enough data. So there's a real push from the Mammal Society at the moment to try and get more records of harvest mice. Um, and actually 2021 is going to be the year of the harvest mouse uh, for the, the mammal group. Um, so please do uh, submit your records if you do see any and we'll have a look at more field signs and things later that you might want to report. Um, they are considered a BAP species, which is a Biodiversity action plan species. Essentially, this means that really locally we should be doing things to encourage um, them and to improve their habitat where we can. Um, and this is because they're thought to have declined by quite a significant amount. Some estimates suggest up to 71% in 18 years. Um, however, it might be simply that we're seeing them less and looking for them less. Um, so this might actually not be a true reflection on their decline. And again, we'll look at that later. 
Our last remaining mouse is the hazel dormouse. Now this isn't really a mouse as such, it's in a different family, the Gliridae, um, and uh, it's actually potentially classed, it's easy to see that it's quite different and um, in terms of being classed in this way, um, because it's not your classic short-lived, fast breeding, die young type mouse. Um, it can live for up to five years um, and it only has one litter per year of about four or five young. Um, so it's quite slow breeding and long lived for such a small mammal. Um, it looks a bit like a harvest mouse in terms of colour. However, it's got this big furry tail um, and these big sticky feet uh, that help it climb up and down trees with actual double jointed hind ankles to help it do so. Um, again, it's got quite a short muzzle. Um, and it does have uh, quite large eyes, as you might expect. Um, and it has really quite noticeable whiskers. And this is help it, uh, to help it move around in its woodland environment. So I'm going to try and play you a video on YouTube if I can to show you this, this movement, the way it uses its whiskers. Um, so uh, dormice are thought to be really quite in decline. Um, under a million is thought to be in the UK. Again, uh, they are associated more with the South and with Wales, and uh, we do have them reintroduced back in Warwickshire. Um, under our British IUCN estimates by the Mammal Society, they are classified as vulnerable, um, and they are a protected Schedule 5 species that, under the Wildlife um, and Countryside Act that we talked about in the last couple of webinars. Um, and this is largely because they have experienced quite a decline, potentially up to 50% in 20 years, um, mostly because of habitat loss and the way in which we're not managing our woodlands as much. And again, I'll talk about that a bit more later. They're generally nocturnal um, and they live in woodland, I've mentioned. So particularly woodland that has been coppiced or is starting to grow up. So that means it's got some early growth, quite a lot of understory. It's quite dense underneath um, rather than just being like really tall old trees that shade out the bottom and there's not much underneath. And they really do use hedgerows and scrubby areas as well. Um, they are actual hibernators. They are true hibernators like hedgehogs, like bats. Um, they hibernate throughout the winter and by now they will uh, have gone if not be going into hibernation. Uh, there is a State of Britain's Dormice report which is released every couple of years. Um, it's available on the PTS website which is really useful to look at in terms of looking at their decline. And there's a great book as well by Pat Morris called Dormice. Uh, somewhat aptly, so again I can send those resources around. So moving on now to our voles. So I mentioned that harvest mice sometimes get confused with voles and um, because of their kind of blunted shortened muzzle um, and, and shorter furrier ears as well. Uh, so our most common vole is our field vole. This is common fare for something like a barn owl, a uh, common food. Um, they're quite shaggy looking, uh, kind of a lightish browny colour and, and, and greyer, darker underneath. Um, and they have quite a short tail, as so they're sometimes called the short tail bowl. Um, and they're associated with uh, quite dry habitats, um, grassy areas and verges and more open, less dense woodland. But then we also have the bank bowl, which can be easily... Um, confused with the field vole. Again, this similar shortened muzzle and, and short furry ears. Um, but this one's much more of a chestnutty colour. Uh, so the, the vole here in the picture actually, I think is probably going through the mulch, so it's less easy, easy to see and it looks a bit um, dishevelled, shall we say. But it's got this beautiful chestnut colour. Um, again, it's slightly greyish and, and white underneath. Um, but it's got a longer tail in comparison to that of the field bowl and it's silvery underneath and this is quite a key characteristic. Generally can be associated with wetter areas um, but really there's quite a crossover between the two and you will often find bank voles in woodland as well. Um, and they're generally active in the day and night, these voles. Uh, so the other vole that we have is the water vole. So this is a considerably larger animal. You'll generally know uh, if you've seen a water vole because it's much bigger. Um, having said that, it is sometimes confused as a rat. Um, so really you've got to look at the face uh, to, to clearly tell the difference. Um, it's got quite a blunt muzzle again, not as pointed as a rat, and these short rounded furry ears. Um, it's also again quite a chestnutty colour similar to the bank vole 
um, and can even be black fur in, in Scotland, um, more of them have black fur. Uh, it's got quite a hairy tail as well, rather than a scaly, ratty tail. Uh, and it tends to swim in its uh, slow flowing riverine environments uh, with its body above the surface of the water, unlike a rat, which tends to just have its head above the water. Uh, so that can be a key characteristic. And when it jumps into the water from, from the riverside, it often makes this characteristic plopping noise, um, which people associate with them. It's generally active during the day, um, and like I say, sort of slow flowing rivers uh, with, with vegetation at the side is quite key, uh, fresh water. Uh, generally, water voles are thought to be in trouble. So the estimate for Britain is only about 130,000 in terms of population. And they are classified in Britain by the Mammal Society as endangered. Uh, again, they're a protected species. Um, and one of the main reasons is in their decline, apart from habitat loss, is really thought to be uh, the spread of the invasive species, the American mink that you can see on the bottom left here, uh, which actually do predate water voles. Um, but in Warwickshire, I'm really happy to say we've got a huge success story with water voles um, in them returning to our watercourses, as you can see a bit in uh, the map here along our canals and watercourses. There's a lot of work being done, particularly in North Warwickshire. Um, and uh, part of this is thought to be because of the return of the otter. Um, so otters actually outcompete American mink and are coming back into their territories. Um, and again, another part of it is to do with the habitat, which we'll look at later. So I'm going to show you a brief video. Again, I'll stop sharing this screen and share uh, one online, which is all about water voles that I think you will enjoy. Okay, so that was uh, the voles. And so as mentioned in the video, the, the water voles, and in fact, all the voles are herbivorous. Um, and they have this key characteristic really of, of cutting grass and vegetation at a 45 degree angle. So if you find piles of vegetation that have been chopped in this way, um, that is usually a telltale sign of a vole, um, unless you might be in beaver territory, but sadly we don't, we don't have those really in Warwickshire. Um, the mice, on the other hand, are, are omnivorous and uh, quite opportunistic usually, um, but the shrews are insectivorous, they only eat insects. Um, and because of this, they tend to need to eat quite a lot and quite frequently, because a lot of the insects that they eat are mostly water, um, and they've got quite high metabolism, high heartbeats, um, they're easily terrified, our shrews. Um, so they form what was the old school order of insectivora. So they have a uh, generally a long muzzle um, and quite small eyes and red teeth. Uh, those are your key characteristics of shrews. Um, so first up, we've got our common shrews. Um, these are the ones uh, that you're more likely to see, really. Uh, they've got um, a, a tail that's about 50% of the length of the body, uh, and they're generally three-toned. Uh, so you've got the uh, dark brown on top, the white underneath, uh, and then the paler sides. Um, all our shrews have got this, this really long muzzle uh, that they use to smell out their invertebrate prey, sometimes even uh, round corners, um, really quite cool looking. Uh, we've also got the pygmy shrews. Um, so uh, these are generally smaller, as you can imagine, but unless you are uh, actively um, looking at them side by side, the common shrew and the pygmy shrew, you might not notice the difference. Uh, crucially, pygmy shrews have a longer tail than common shrews, and they also have quite a domed head. Um, and if you can see the difference, which sometimes you can't, um, they, they have more of a two-tone rather than a three-tone coloration to their body. So they're often quite a bit darker on top, um, and then they're pale underneath. We also have the water shrew. So water shrews, as you can imagine, associated with more of a water habitat um, and uh, they're less likely to be seen. In fact, um, we're not really sure how many there are in Warwickshire. We think that there might not be that many. Um, so if you do see some of these, it's quite exciting. Um, the picture here is of quite a young one. This was a juvenile out dispersing um, and you can see just how monochromatic, how black and white that, that shrew is. It really does look quite different to the other two. Um, and it's quite, um, it stays like that, that monochromatic way as an adult, maybe not quite as clear. Um, it's got quite short fur that holds the air 
um, that helps it not to get too waterlogged. And it has this ruddery like tail uh, with stiff hairs on uh, to help it navigate its, its water type environment. Um, they do obviously have different habitats, but again, uh, similar to the voles and the mice, they've got quite an, an, uh, a crossover there. So pygmy shrews uh, tend to be more associated with arid habitats, although we find them in woodland just like uh, common shrews as well. Um, again, crossover, but water shrews generally uh, are more associated with, with water, where they, they're in aquatic, aquatic invertebrates and with muddy riverbanks. Um, so uh, the, the water shrews actually are quite cool in that they have a venomous bite. So they produce this venom um, and, and put it into their saliva to help them subdue their aquatic prey. Uh, of course, if you get bitten by one, it can cause some irritation. I wouldn't advise picking them up at all. Um, even uh, common shrews produce a sort of um, unpleasant taste for predators and uh, to try and warn them off as well. And so I'm not going to talk about these too much today because I did talk about them uh, in depth in their own solo webinar before. Um, but just to be said, they are classed by the IUCN Small Mammal Specialist Group as small mammals. And um, we've got the Western European species over here. Um, obviously identifiable from its up to 7,000 banded spikes. Um, and uh, you know it's nocturnal and it's got that special muscle that I talked about, the orbicularis muscle that helps it to curl up into a ball. Um, very eclectic in terms of the habitat that it uses, a generalist species and actually quite likes urban areas. Uh, we know that it's in decline potentially of up to 50% in the last 20 years, um, so work is underway to help this now classified British vulnerable species um, to get it up to um, more numbers. And you can find loads of information about hedgehogs on our website at Warwickshire Wildlife Trust, owing to the hedgehog projects that we have run for the last five or so years. So please do check that out. Um, also, like I say, there is a webinar on it, uh, which will either be put online in the future or I can try and send out if you missed it. So the last one in the Ulick Typhler order is the mole. Um, so moles are absolutely fascinating animals that I feel passionately about that are really overlooked. Um, largely because people just don't understand them because they don't see them because they live a life mostly underground. Uh, juveniles are the ones that are tended to be seen more as they disperse outwards um, and they come up above ground. But sometimes moles do come up above, above ground anyway, um, uh, particularly maybe to get some food from the surface. So we have a European mole species. It actually isn't related to something like a golden mole that you might have seen um, online from abroad. Um, because it is um, an example of what we call convergent evolution, where two animals came up with a great adaptation, a great way to adapt to their environment completely independently of each other. Uh, but our moulds, uh, you can see how they're related to hedgehogs and shrews. They have this really long nose um, that they use for sniffing out insects, um, particularly earthworms for moles. Um, they hardly have any eyes, really. They're very small and their ears aren't really external. They're tucked in to stop them getting filled with uh, soil. Uh, the nose is really, really sensitive. Uh, that's its main form of, of sense, really, and its way of uh, communicating with each other as well. Um, crucially, the, well, the fur is really cool because you can brush it any directions. This helps it to dispel out the earth from when it digs. Um, but it, its main kind of crucial adaptation that you'll notice is its hands and arms and shoulders at the front. Um, so these are designed so that they are turned outwards. So actually seeing it run along ground is quite hard. Um, and that's so that it can dig uh, the tunnels that it makes, potentially a thousand meters of tunnel um, for its own home territory. Um, and those have got claws on them to help it dig and actually stiff hairs to help um, with the kind of dust out the earth as it goes. It's also got locking back feet uh, with an extra bone in to help uh, keep it in place as it frantically digs with those front arms. Um, on its chest, it's got quite thick skin to protect it as it digs and moves around in its tunnels. Um, and the way its bones are designed are quite cool so that it can actually turn back around 90 degrees uh, to turn around in, a, in quite a tight tunnel, a bit like a hamster if you've seen it turning around in a, in a tube in a cage. Moles aren't really uh, active in the day or night. They have periods of four hours sleep and then four hours where they're active. And they're found across a wide range of environments, 
um, and of course are known as a, as a pest species in some land, particularly farmland. Um, moles are not uh, thought of as an endangered species in Britain particularly, uh, we thought to have about 41 million of them, however they are massively under recorded um, really because people don't see them because they live underground but also because they're thought to be so common that people don't report having seen molehills which we'll look at later on um, and there's a real push at the moment particularly here in Warwickshire because we have hardly any records of moles even though we know they must be around and um, for people to get recording um, moles uh, and molehills here so you can send your records into the Warwickshire Mammal Group they're really looking um, to make a map of our moles um, there's also a fabulous book that I would recommend um, by Rob Atkinson on moles, which is a great read and really interesting. There was an interesting question from Jake that I caught up with in the chat um, in the break. It was about whether dull mice consciously move their whiskers. So we saw that video um, of them of moving their whiskers. So they do purposely and actively explore their environment with their whiskers. And they also make this kind of circular continuous motion it's a bit sort of more back and forward and um, that's called whisking and um, that you might well have um, seen before okay all right i think we'll just get started and people can join us and when they they come back again and um, please do interject if you want um especially if i'm not answering you in the chat because i just can't really see it when i share the screen um, and uh, feel free to, to ask any questions or tell me if you can't see or hear anything. So I'll just go back to sharing my screen. This, this second section now that we're going to do on surveying will be uh, quite a bit more interactive for you. So don't worry if you're starting to get a little bit zoomed out. Uh, okay, so we were just looking at the Ulipotifla, um, having looked at the voles and the mice. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, surveying for them. So really the main method that we use when surveying for small mammals is longworth trapping. So uh, this is one method of live trapping, so it doesn't harm them, it's, it's not um, mortality trapping, it's uh, just a way um, of us to see what, what we have and then releasing them in the same place where we found them. Um, there are a variety of different traps that you can use. Here in Britain, we tend to use the Longworth trap. It's generally thought to be the safest trap and we can bait it um, and put bedding in there. So uh, we usually put some kind of nice hay bedding in there. It's a bit like a hotel. Some animals keep returning to the traps. They must really enjoy being in there, um, mainly because they get a plethora of food as well as a bed. Um, so we bait it uh, usually with things like um, live mealworms or mealworms that have been frozen and defrosted because they still contain moisture and some chicken feed and some nice porridge oats uh, which harvest mice are particularly um, fond of. Uh, so we bait them and we set those traps somewhere logical so uh, usually uh, you can see in the middle picture there it's among a kind of grassy area um, that is quite commonly used by small mammals. You can even try and place them amongst vole runs so they're little little tunnels running around the base of the grass um, which small mammals will use and there's some sort of uh, field signs and techniques that you can use to try and find those um, so we set those usually overnight um, uh, for a set amount of time and then we come and look at them and release them early in the morning uh, so that they haven't been in there too long you do require a license to do this and some specialized knowledge about how to deal with the animals that you're trapping and how to handle them if you want to afterwards and um, so uh, just bear that in mind as well uh, when we find them you can collect the information that you need quickly uh, so often we'll look at obviously what species it is and we'll try and age and sex the animal which I'm doing in the uh, middle picture there which is uh, more difficult than it sounds if it's something like a small harvest mouse and um, not only can you get an idea of presence and absence data from longworth trapping but you can also get an idea of populations if you um, particularly if you fur clip as you can see this um, harvest mouse has got a particular pattern of fur clipping uh, which grows back within a couple of weeks and um, so you can do sort of mark and recapture that way um, it used to be done by apparently cutting off toes of the mice uh, which 
sounds horrible and I'm glad that isn't a legitimate technique anymore and we just do a bit of fur clipping which doesn't hurt them. Uh, there are two main guides that I would recommend if you're looking at surveying for small mammals, uh, which I've listed down the bottom here, um, both by the Mammal Society. Again, I can send these around in, in an email with the resources later on. Uh, so another method that you can use to survey for small mammals is nest searching. So this is particularly the case for harvest mice. Uh, it's the most reliable method of surveying for harvest mice. It only gives you an idea of presence or absence though, um, because uh, one mouse might make multiple nests. So you can't just count them and say how many mice you have. And um, now is an absolute ideal time to be looking for harvest mice nests. Vegetation has grown back a bit, so you can try and see them amongst the dense vegetation. Um, and also it's not too late in the winter that they've become a bit dilapidated and battered from the elements. There are methods of how to search for them. So with a continuous effort um, over a certain distance for a certain amount of time, um, but you can just go out and have a little look yourselves, um, like I mentioned before. Um, and generally you'll usually find one with about 10 minutes if they're there. But having said that, that is if you've got your eye in and you know exactly what you're looking for. So it might take you a bit longer uh, if you're more of a novice about it. But harvest mice, I'll show you some pictures in a minute. They make really distinctive woven nests. Um, that are usually the breeding nests are above the ground by about 30, 40 centimetres. But crucially, they are woven around the suspended stem. So they stay in situ. So they often will weave green leaves in from the grass into the nest in situ. Um, and this, this keeps the, um, the nests green uh, throughout the breeding period um, and camouflages them quite well as keeping them upright in, in the stems. They do often make non-breeding nests though, which are used as temporary shelters, often by both sexes. These tend to be smaller, about four centimetres, um, and are usually at the base of grass tussocks or on the ground. Uh, so do look out for those too. Um, and we find um, these nests in a range of vegetation, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, but really they'll, they'll make those nests amongst grasses, particularly those um, that are quite strong standing grasses and tussock forming amongst um, uh, reeds even. So they can be very high in reed beds. If you've got a densely packed reed bed, uh, then they might even be one and a half metres up sometimes in those reed beds. And they'll also commonly make them amongst rushes, brambles, meadow sweet, um, willow herb, things like that, um, and coxfoot grasses. So uh, for the top left, you can see a kind of characteristic breeding nest. Uh, you can see that how it's attached around the bramble there. Uh, so it's, it's held in situ. This one probably at the bottom is more of a temporary or non-breeding nest because uh, it's quite small and that's found more at the base of the grass tussocks. But again, you can see that woven structure, finely shredded grass woven together. And you'll find these in all sorts of habitats. So harvest mice are traditionally associated with arable farmland. That's where you find them quite a lot. And um, usually if you've got these kind of dense field margins with hedgerows next to them, and they'll use the hedgerows more in winter and, and nest at the base of these in the winter. Uh, but they are also found in a range of other habitats, including, as I've mentioned, dense reed beds. So the reeds have to be quite close together because they're only a small mouse to travel around. Um, pastoral land with, with scrub, so you can see that on the top left there, um, really scrubby areas with lots of bramble, um, and some wetter areas, often urban areas with tussocky grass and, and bulrushes as well. Um, because they move around in the stems in the summer, it doesn't really matter if it's too wet, um, it only matters when they're moving around in the winter, um, in which case they're more on the ground to keep warmer, so they tend to not be in the wetter areas then. But they transition between the habitats, they don't have to stay permanently in one place. So this is a video uh, of me doing some harvest mouse trapping. So uh, the longworth technique is used for pretty much all the, of the smaller of the small mammals. And um, so that's um, in this video, it's about harvest mice, but it could equally about be about voles and shrews as well. Um, and also at the end, you can see me finding a nest.
Okay, so hopefully on that, um, you got a, a flavour of what it's like um, to live trap some small mammals, in this case, harvest mice. So for harvest mice, we use the excluder that was mentioned at the beginning, which is essentially really chicken wire. Um, and that's used for harvest mice and shrews because they're so small. So it stops the traps being filled up by other animals, for instance, voles, which quite readily go into long lead traps um, so that you only get the little things that go in. You can see what happens when the trap is triggered. Um, and then we have a look at the animals and put them back. Also at the end, you saw um, a harvest mouse nest amongst the vegetation, that was a breeding nest. Um, so the technique really involves carefully um, being in some longer vegetation. You always need to wear um, long trousers and boots uh, to uh, counteract those ticks. Be careful with that, if health and safety wise, you're going into those areas and some thick gloves um, and you, carefully part the vegetation along the length of it because remember you can get harvest mouse nests at the, at the base as well of the tussocks and have a look and see what you found and then put it back um, and you just go through the vegetation like this having a look to see what you can find. Okay so next up I'd uh, like us to play a bit of a game um, called Where's the Nest? Um, so the idea is here that I've taken some zoomed out images of harvest mouse nests amongst the vegetation um, and what I'd like you to do is guess where the nest is. So I'm going to use a feature on Zoom called Animate, uh, so I'll turn that on now. So hopefully uh, on your screens there is um, a icon, it usually looks like a pencil, might look like a pen, um, might even be called annotate depending on whether you're using a phone or a computer and what you should be able to do now I think is uh, to circle or point or use an arrow um, or mark with a cross where you think the um, nest is on the left hand picture so if you want to have a go at that again shout if you can't find a way to do this Yay, someone has done it. <laughs> okay, anyone want to add where they think the nest is? Okay, I think you might be all done. Okay, so I think um, the first one got this right. So if you look, you can see that it's in the middle uh, where your squiggles are. Um, so this is the zoomed in section of the nest. So it can be quite hard to spot. This one wasn't too bad, um, but you still need to get your eye and you can see the fine weave um, and how it doesn't go in the vertical direction because obviously it's spherical. Okay, so the next one on the right hand side is a bit harder. Um, so let's see if you can have a go at that one. So I'll put annotate on again. So hopefully you should be able to see some kind of icon there. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't really know. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> no problem. Be a very large nest if it was that. Okay, we've got one idea. Anyone else want to add? Okay, great. We've got a couple there. Any last minute additions? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. I'll, uh, I'll turn that off now and reveal the answer. So the answer is actually there, right in the middle. Um, so hopefully you can see the outline here. Um, so in the bottom right is the picture here. Um, hopefully you can match that to that. So that one's a lot more difficult to see. You can see there's a real range of vegetation in there, not just the grasses and the brambles and, and that. So um, this was also found later on in the season. So it's a bit wet um, and a bit more disheveled. Um, but good work, guys. Um, a lot of that looks like nests. Okay, and then hopefully we should have two more nests. Um, oh, okay, so I think I might need to 
clear the annotations. Um, so I'll clear all the drawings. Okay, um, so I've got animate up again. So if you want to just, um, you can do it for the left and the right pictures if you want. Uh, we can do them both together. Great, got some answers coming in. Thanks for taking part in this. Always makes it more fun. Okay, great. Any last minute additions anyone wants to make? No, okay, I think we'll end it there and have a look at the uh, results. Some keen-eyed people in this group, it's great. You have no trouble finding some nests. Um, okay, so in this one, uh, I think pretty much all of you got it. Um, looking in the middle section here, so that's a zoomed in version of that area. You can actually see the entrance hole in this one. They tend to cover up that hole uh, in the first few days when the babies are in there. Um, but then it just tends to get left open as they exit. Uh, this one was quite a bit trickier, the one on the right. Actually, I don't think anyone got this one. It's in the middle there. Um, it's still difficult to see, even when zoomed in on. Um, but it is there, I promise you, I, I found this nest. Um, less thinly woven, more, more fatter in its strands, um, but still a harvest mouse nest. Uh, so hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavour. I think there's quite a few keen-eyed people there. So there's no reason to not go out and have a look uh, when you can within lockdown restrictions, of course, um, and have a look for some nests. And you can always send me pictures if you're not sure, um, or if you're pretty sure, feel free to send them to the Mammal Society or um, the Warwickshire Mammal Group that will collect your records, or the Warwickshire Biological Record Centre that we'll talk about later. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so other animals do make nests, of course, other small mammals in particular. Um, so here's just some ways to differentiate them. So the survey method is only really for harvest mice uh, in terms of nest searching. It's more opportunistic to find nests of the other animals that you might see. Um, it's not necessarily a method to find them. So dorm mice make nests that are similar to harvest mouse nests, but they're quite a bit bigger. Um, so they're more grapefruit sized rather than orange sized. And they're usually made out of shredded honeysuckle bark rather than grass. Um, and the leaves aren't necessarily woven in, but there are some leaves in there, deciduous leaves. Uh, the one on, there's some ones on the right here, which are a bit green. Usually they do have some fresh green leaves in there, whereas wood mice um, and other mice tend to make piles of just dead brown leaves um, without much structure. This nest was actually found in a dormouse box, which we'll talk about later. Um, you also get voles that make nests. So on the bottom left here, you'll see a sort of classic field vole nest in the summer. This can be really easily mistaken for a harvest mouse nest. Um, but if you look closely, it doesn't really have a spherical structure. It's not really woven. It's more like a pile of shredded material. And some of those shreds are really quite short. Um, and characteristically, if you look at a few of them, it's going to be really hard to see on this picture, um, but they will be shredded at that 45 degree angle that voles are so uh, into cutting at. Um, so not much structure, usually at the base of tussocks, um, just a clump of material. Uh, they do also use burrows as well, field voles. Bank voles tend to have a, a, a lot more moss and other feathery materials in their nests. This again is one um, in a dormouse box um, and you can probably see the litter of babies around here. And again, they will use burrows as well. Uh, water voles use burrows on the, on the riverside, on the banks, um, and uh, we saw the field sign of that being wide um, on the video before. Then you get your shrews. So shrews will also use burrows. Um, pygmy shrews don't really excavate their own, they'll just try and use someone else's since they're so small to excavate it. Common shrews might excavate their own, um, 
but they also make these nests sort of under leaf litter and on the ground as well. And also you get hedgehogs which make nests. So we talked about that in the hedgehog webinar. Um, they make day nests mostly just out of grass pulled over them in the summer, but they also make um, slightly more eclectic nursery nests and even more robust hibernation nests or hibernacular, uh, which this one is on the bottom right here. Um, so you can uh, see that this is really a huge pile of leaves, about 30 centimetres, 40 centimetres wide, um, which has been layered um, and then a, a hedgehog has gone in underneath, often under something to provide some protection. Um, so it might be under a hedge or amongst some bramble to keep it in place, under a shed, uh, even in a compost heap, something like that. Um, sometimes moles will make what, what's called fortresses. And these can be really quite large, even bigger than hedgehog nests above the ground. And they often make them in areas that are more prone to flooding or, or with sandier soils. And um, they don't really know why they make them, but amongst these fortresses are nests inside, um, but they're more, more unusual to see, I would say. They usually have their nests underground. Uh, so another method that you can use to find evidence of small mammals is owl pellets. Now I'd really uh, encourage you to have a look at some owl pellets. So pellets are produced by a wide variety of birds, not just owls. You get them from corvids and, and all sorts of birds. Um, they're often mistaken as being poo or droppings, but they're not. They're actually um, the undigested remains of what the owl or, or bird eats um, that is compacted and ejected back out through the mouth. And the ones in the picture here are barn owl pellets. They're sort of your biggest, roundest, greyest, most obvious pellets that you'll find. Um, and they're great to dissect. They often contain remains, about four or five prey items in each uh, pellet you'll find. Um, so if you know anyone that does any barn owl checks that of course are under license, they might clear these out regularly um, from the roosts. Um, or you might um, find them in clumps by roosts if you, if you know where they are. Or you might just come across pellets generally from all different types of birds that you could have a look to dissect. You can even buy pellets on, on eBay, I believe. Um, although these might contain more um, remnants of, of other remains, not characteristic not characteristic of those that owls might eat in the wild because um, they've been in captivity when they produce these pellets. Anyway, I encourage you to have a look. Um, we might even try and do an owl pellet workshop when things have to be less socially distanced um, because it often helps to be looking at things closely because the remains are so small. There's some resources here again that I'll send out including a particularly great freely downloadable RSPB by PB guide and your usual fold out FSC guide which are brilliant. Um, so uh, generally uh, when you um, look at an owl pellet as a beginner you'll be looking at the jaws so you'll find all sorts of bone remains because you'll have the whole prey so you'll have the ribs you'll have the tail you'll, you'll have everything in there the vertebrae um, but to identify the the remains it's easiest to look at the jaws often particularly the lower jaws um, and amongst other things you might things, find things like uh, frogs or um, bats even um, but generally you can class the remains that you'll find in say a barn owl pellet into the mice or rats, uh, the voles and the shrews or the eulipotifler uh, type remains that includes the moles. Um, so you might get more mousy ratty remains um, which look very similar to our teeth. They look like our molars, our rounded molars. You can't really see from the top view here um, but they're, they're rounded, sometimes ground down um, but they look very much like our teeth, apart from obviously that front ratty continuously growing incisor that you get the, the yellow one uh, here. Rats generally look very similar to mice, it's just their sheer size of being bigger that makes them rats. Um, you also get voles, so vole remains, this is um, an upper jaw actually, uh, generally have a zigzag pattern that I'm hoping that you can see on this one. So field voles in particular uh, have quite a sharp zigzaggy pattern overall, uh, whereas bank voles have quite a swishy, more S-y, curvy um, pattern overall to their to their zigzag, if that makes sense. And water voles, of course, are quite large. You often don't find water vole jaw remains uh, in an owl pellet because the owl 
will actually rip off the head of the bowl and leave it behind and then just swallow the rest somewhat grimly. And um, so sometimes you need to be looking for other bones like the pelvis, for instance, that can help you identify it. And again, by its sheer size, you'll know generally that it's a water bowl. And then you get your other remains. So shrews um, generally have these sharp little teeth that they use to, to crunch the insects that they eat. Um, but they're usually red tipped. Um, and this is a kind of enamel type substance um, that helps harden them against the, the remains of the insects that they eat. Um, often when the shrews are older, this, this red tip has worn off a bit, um, so it's not as easy to see. This looks to, be, to me to be quite an old shrew, this jaw here, because there's not as much red as you might see. Moles have a similar looking um, jaw, um, but there's not usually the, the red tips. And shrews, you can tell the difference between the species of shrew by looking at this front tooth here um, and seeing how many notches there are on it. So you've really got to get up and close. A hand lens or magnifier does help if you've got one um, and you can, you can try and count those notches on that front uh, tooth there. Um, so it's really worth exploring. Just trial and error. You can have a look and see what you find and use some of these basic guides, some of which are available for free. Uh, so what I uh, like to try and do now is a classic guess the jaw and um, so I'm going to put up some pictures and then we're going to do some polls if you want to take part. So the polls are anonymous and um, so please do feel free to take part. Um, so I'll launch this one first and so hopefully you've all got a chance to see what this jaw is. If you want to have a little vote Okay, I think most of you have voted now, so I'll end that poll. Okay, and I'll share those results with you. Uh, so the consensus is common true. Uh, so I think you're, you're great on your Alpella analysis so far. So I would say this is probably common true. Um, it's hard to tell uh, whether it'd be a pygmy shrew because they'd, they'd be smaller, so you can't really get that reference necessarily on a zoom from looking at a picture. Um, but you can tell it's probably not a water shrew because there are some indentations on that front tooth. So usually that would be much flatter if it was a water shrew. Um, and you can sort of count the notches and have a look at how they're arranged to see if it's a common shrew. Okay, so uh, I'm going to have a, a go at the next one now. Okay, so I'll start the poll for this one. Sometimes the poll covers up the picture, so I'm just giving you a chance to look at the picture first. And um, you've got the same options that will come up. Okay, so I'll just launch this one. Now uh, the clue here I would say is that it's quite large. Okay, most of you have voted now, so um, I'll uh, share the results now. Okay, so the consensus here is rat, which is indeed correct. Um, so the clue being that it's big, but it's got the mousy type molars, really, that look quite like our teeth. That's the main giveaway there. Okay, then we'll move on to this next one. Um, hopefully you can still see that with uh, the pole up.
Okay, again, most of you have voted, so I'll end the poll there. Uh, most of you have voted for field goal, which is indeed correct. So hopefully you can see that quite sharp zigzaggy jawline there. You can see the teeth zigzagging along. Okay, um, I'll just get the next one ready. So this one is actually missing a tooth, but hopefully you can still get the general overall idea. Okay, most of you have voted, so I'll end the poll there. You guys are great. I don't know how much alcohol analysis you've already done, but um, this is brilliant. So this is bank vault. So you can see it's got the zigzag, but it's um, much less sharp. It's more of an F shape, uh, a more subtle bend to the teeth. Okay, and then we've just got one more of these. So I'll let you look at that one before um, I launch the poll because it's in the middle and sometimes that blocks your screen. A little look and I'll launch the poll. Uh, so the clue to this one is that it's really small. Okay, most of you voted now, so I'll end that and share that now. Um, so again, mostly correct. Well, hey, hopefully you got the oh, oh hopefully you got the um, small clue. Uh, so this is in fact a harvest mouse. So you can see it's got molars, mousy molars, similar to our own here, and um, but it's really tiny if you were to see it in the bone, as it were. Um, and actually, if you were to remove the teeth from this jaw you would find that there would be seven holes. Um, so our mice, um, for their lower jaws, if you remove the teeth and count the number of, of holes, uh, you can actually differentiate between the different mice species, which is really useful. But I always advise looking at the teeth first before you pull them out, um, because you can't really easily put them back in again, especially with something as tiny as a harvest mouse. So um, have a go, um, have a see if you can get any pellets, and if not, we might try and do something next year. Um, really interesting. There's so much more to it um, that I could tell you, but I just want to give you a, a brief introduction. Okay, so uh, there's something else you can do uh, to look for signs of small mammals, and this is nut hunting. So nut hunting is really useful for checking for signs of dormice specifically, and actually it's thought to be the best method to check whether they're present or absent in a woodland or not. Um, so again, this is something that you can get out and about doing under lockdown restrictions, of course. Um, if you've got a woodland near you, you can go and check for signs to see if harvest mice are around. So you can go and look for nuts on the ground and see how they've been open. So um, squirrels and sometimes birds will characteristically crush the nut in two. So it's just cleanly broken in two and cleaved. Um, but other small mammals leave telltale signs. Now is an ideal time to go out looking for nuts for dormice, by the way. So um, if you do want to get out there over the winter, do have a look. Again, there is a set methodology that you can use, but uh, really for your purposes, you can just go out and have a look. Um, so uh, if you have a look at the nuts here, you can see that hopefully that they're, they've been chewed open differently. Uh, so the first nut has been opened by a wood mouse and you can see that it's got a really messy outside. Um, that's the, the best way to describe it. It's really messy on the outside of the nut where it's been opening it. And that's characteristic of a wood mouse. Um, wood mice and, and other mice also characteristically leave caches of nuts. So there'll be a pile of nuts, whereas a dormouse will specifically 
eat the nut that it finds there and then where it's found it, drop it and then move on to the next one. So you really only find them singly. Sometimes they take them back to their nest, one or two, um, but not in caches in the same way as the, the other mice. So the middle one has been opened by a bank bowl. So it's some really quite sharp vertical motions and quite tidy on the outside. And this third one has been opened by a dormouse. Now it's quite hard to see on the picture, um, but hopefully you can see there are some sweeping circular lines going around here. This circular motion is characteristic of a dormouse nut. No other animal will do that. This nut is quite messy on the outside, so you might mistake it for a wood mouse nut. Um, I think it's probably been done it by a young, quite inexperienced dormouse, um, but you can clearly see up close when you see the nut, these circular motions around here. So do go out nut hunting, it's good fun. Another way that you can survey for dormouse and, re and really monitor them is to do box checks. So in places where we suspect that there are dormice, we will often erect boxes on trees in, within the woodland. They look like bird boxes, uh, but they've got the hole around the back instead of at the front. And you have to have a license to do this, but you go around and you check the boxes once a month in the summer months to see if you've got any nests or residents. And um, really, these are just some cute pictures of dormice of the different ages that you find. So from really, really young at the top here um, to getting a bit older and their eyes opening um, over here. And they're quite flighty youngsters here and um, to an adult here. Um, and this, this one is a what we call a dormouse in torpor. It's sort of um, a, a mini hibernation state uh, before it goes into full hibernation. Um, they often make quite cute snoring noises. There's lots of videos online if you want to YouTube any of them. Um, but you have to be particularly careful when you've got a, a dormouse which is torpid and conserving energy. So I'm going to show you a video now of some box checks uh, that we've done in our woodlands. As a rare and declining species, hazel dormice were reintroduced to this woodland in 2018. Once a month in the summer, volunteers monitor them by checking to see if they are using boxes put up on trees. The hole at the back is stoppered to prevent escapees, and the lid carefully slid across to check for dormice or their nests. This box is taken down to be checked as there is a nest inside. It has green leaves, characteristic of dormice. The corners and inside are carefully checked to see if there are any mice inside. But sadly, no one is home, so the box is returned to the tree with the hole opened up. The information is carefully recorded. Another box has a nest inside, and so is checked. There are very fresh green leaves. But again, no one is home.
This box has some hazelnuts inside. Which appear to have been nibbled by bank rolls. opening this box there is a litter of dormice jumping around inside. This is why the box is opened in a large bag. The wriggly little mice are carefully picked up and placed in individual bags. This helps us to quickly process them without harming them as they have plenty of air. They are scanned to see if they have been chipped already to help us identify them. Then they are weighed. These youngsters weigh between 9 and 10 grams each and are of the age class Eyes Open. Mum is with them, weighing in at a healthy 22 and a half grams. The baldness around her nipples shows she has been lactating. This one shows us he is male. And this one, female. They are all returned to the box, somewhat reluctantly. The stopper is removed and they are left in peace. It is great to have seen young dormice and to know they have bred this year. We continue the search. This can be hard work because dormice like dense areas of the woodland with plenty of understory. The woodland is managed by Warwickshire Wildlife Trust with this in mind. Areas are cut back and coppiced over time to help them rejuvenate. With thanks to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who have allowed us to do this great work. Hashtag Wilder Future, hashtag Wilder Warwickshire. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a flavour of what it's like to be on doormat checks. Um, other field signs, so these aren't necessarily other methods that we put here, they're more field signs. Um, so for small mammals, uh, you often obviously get droppings, um, but they can be quite hard to differentiate between them and they're quite opportunistic in where you might find them. However, for something like a water bowl, they're an excellent field sign. Um, so it was mentioned in the video what they look like, sort of tic tacs. Uh, often quite green coloured and they're found in piles or the trees near where the water bowl burrows are. So it's worth looking for those. Um, also some droppings can be DNA'd now um, with, with advancing techniques and sniffer dogs are now able to differentiate some um, droppings between others if you take them back to the lab. Hair tube analysis, so sometimes um, this is used for different mammals. So this can be a bit unreliable in terms of getting results and you do need a microscope uh, to look at the hairs, so not necessarily great in the field. Of course you can employ uh, some detection work with some um, good old fashioned, or not old fashioned as we should say, uh, remote cameras which can be useful. Um, sniffer dogs I've mentioned, they can actually be used out in the field as well to pick up field signs of certain things, but obviously you don't want dogs sniffing out uh, small mammals as such and terrifying them, um, so they've got to be well trained. Uh, footprint tunnels, so I've mentioned before in terms of hedgehogs, if you went to the hedgehog webinar, but these are a great way to detect the presence and absence of a wide variety of mammals, and they're now being employed specifically for dormice, 
Um, so a smaller version of the hedgehog tunnel is used in woodland, particularly along hedgerows, and they're really effective at detecting the presence of door mice and can be done without a license, which is of course beneficial. Uh, looking for molehills, so I've mentioned uh, these before. So these are great signs of molds, uh, one of the best ones, um, you know, clumps of earth. Sometimes they, you find them in lines, um, and this can be a sign that a male uh, mole has been on the hunt for a female and has directly gone towards her in a straight line, which is quite fun to see. Uh, also field signs, Sarah mentioned about voles cutting vegetation at 45 degree angles. So uh, for water voles, that's one of the main field signs that you can look for in the summer for them. Um, you'll see clumps of this vegetation together all cut in a similar way. Um, and of course for hedgehogs, again, I mentioned in the hedgehog webinar, you can torchlight survey for them. So you can go out uh, at night under license and look with big torches to see if you can see hedgehogs and get an idea of their population size. So in terms of threats to our small mammals, uh, natural threats wise, often weather is the big killer. So this is particularly true of things like harvest mice and door mice. So door mice have issues as hibernators if the temperature fluctuates. And also they just generally have quite a high mortality in the winter if they haven't um, built up enough fat reserves uh, so that can be a problem. Harvest mice sometimes get flooded out uh, but hopefully they can transition to other areas uh, when when there's flooding and they've been known to be quite adaptable to this. But if their nest gets saturated then sometimes particularly in the summer if there's heavy rain um, the young might not survive so quite high mortality rates in the winter. It's also predation. So I mentioned um, that uh, water voles in particular are predated by the, um, the invasive rather American mink. Um, unfortunately, the harvest mouse in this picture did not make it. It was predated upon. I know the, the photographer who took this, very sad. Harvest mice tend to be very low down in the food chain, eaten by all sorts of things from corvids to cats to weasels, uh, even pheasants take the young in the nest sometimes. Um, badgers mainly um, are known uh, for competing uh, with something like hedgehogs, but also predating on them as well. And they might predate on door mice in woodlands who actually just hibernate on the ground. They come down from the trees and they hibernate on the ground. Also, as I mentioned, competition from badgers potentially, but there's competition from um, the invasive grey squirrel in woodlands with door mice for the food because they eat the same foods. Um, and there's also a problem with deer browsing. Um, so deer tend to uh, eat the young growth, the young shoots, which of course door mice require um, woodland regeneration. They need that dense understory, that dense growth that we talked about. So stopping this forming is quite a problem for them. There are other threats, human ones. So potentially induced by humans climate change. So this nest of the harvest mouse was originally taken a picture of in November when it was a dead old breeding nest. Um, and then some green had been woven into it and it was actually being used as a breeding nest in January, which is quite unusual timing because uh, harvest mice tend to be summer breeders um, uh, because there's more food available. So again, hot, warm temperatures in the winter uh, might have prompted this for them to breed uh, over this period of time. Harvest mice, one of the reasons I thought to have been in decline is because of the advent of the combine harvester um, getting them caught in the machinery. But actually, probably the adults are quite likely to be able to escape most of the time. Maybe not the youngsters, depending on when uh, it's cut and um, if that was in the summer when they're breeding. However, we're just not noticing them as much with the advent of the machinery. We're not seeing them as much. And the way that we've farmed has changed. So we're not necessarily having the crops all year round. Um, or certainly at the same time of year that we would have done um, to coincide with harvest mouse breeding season. Um, so they might be limited on food. And of course, there's pesticide use that might be an issue. For door mice, uh, woodland really, I've mentioned that you need that early successional stage, that, that young growth, that understory coming up, that dense growth. Um, and without us managing the woodlands by cutting the trees down low in some areas over time, um, which we call coppicing or potentially thinning out areas, taking out some of the bigger trees. Uh, we just don't get this. So we do need to manage our woodlands appropriately for dormice. Um, and sometimes heavy machinery coming in in the winter can crush the dormice because I've mentioned that they hibernate um, on the ground. 
Habitat loss affects um, all small mammals really, but particularly when we're talking about the removal of hedgerows, because we know that small mammals love hedgerows. They use them um, to disperse from, to travel along for connectivity. They nest amongst them, they feed in them. Uh, they're really important for our small mammals. Habitat fragmentation also happens from loss of hedgerows, but also in urban areas um, from things like roads and, and uh, railways. Road kill for hedgehogs, uh, we talked about before is a big problem, up to um, 350,000 hedgehogs die each year on our British roads from roadkill. Um, then there's things like pollution, so this might be more indirect than you think. So for instance, for water bowls, uh, if we've got what we call eutrophication and too much nitrogen uh, from maybe chemicals that are washing off farmland, um, then this can cause algal blooms in our river and water systems. And this in turn then blocks out other vegetation being from being able to grow, which uh, water voles would feed off of being being herbivores. Then uh, there's things like river and canal bank reinforcement. So this again is particularly true for water voles. So we know that water voles make their burrows in and they feed off of that that bankside vegetation. They can't burrow into concrete um, and there's no vegetation for them to have a munch on. Um, so that's a problem as well. There are lots of things that we can do to help. So the main thing that you can do is to record mammals and signs of the, the small mammals that you see. So we've talked about all those. So I did a project back in 2015, 2016 on harvest mice, and we went from having just 12 records across, across a decade to having 180 records in just six months. I surveyed all across the county using long word trapping, owl pellet analysis, and uh, also nest searching. We know that nest searching is really the most reliable method for harvest mice and is something that you could be doing uh, if you think you see an area of habitat that's um, that seems very mousy to you. And again, you can send in your records, like I mentioned, to the mammal group, um, to the Warwickshire Biological Record Centre, as you can for all records in Warwickshire of animals, um, flora and fauna. Um, and also there is a, a mammal mapper app, which you can um, find out more about from the Mammal Society. Uh, as well, which is more nationwide. Uh, so I encourage you to go out and look for these signs that we've talked about, look for some harvest mouse nests, you know, go on a nut hunt for some dormouse nuts, um, record your molehills, particularly to Warwickshire Mammal Group, and if you find any pellets, have a go at dissecting them, have a go at opening them up. You can use just a tweezer and a cocktail stick if you don't have anything else, and um, just to try and carefully tear them apart and have a look at some of those remains. Um, also, uh, you can, if you've got one or you know someone that's got one, you can try and set up a remote camera. In the summertime, um, you can go out looking for signs of water voles, like those feeding signs or the burrows, um, and you can set some footprint tunnels for hedgehogs, for instance, and other mammals that you might find, and other, even birds and, and frogs and toads go into them, newts, things like that that we talked about in the last webinar. Um, but the winter really is a great time to be looking for signs of small mammals, and it's something that you can do while social distancing. So uh, lockdown restrictions um, abiding by and um, see if you can find some signs of small mammals. There are other ways that we can help small mammals. So particularly for harvest mice and hedgehogs, I've mentioned the importance of hedgerows, but these next to some really great field margins are fantastic um, places to, to nest and feed. Um, ideally, you don't want to cut these too often. And when you do cut them, you want them rotation so you've still got some areas less left where the animals can can congregate to. There are some some farming agri-environment schemes that, that can give farmers money to help them um, put these field margins and hedgerows in and actually um, harvest mice were first discovered in Hampshire by Gilbert White in 1767. He first distinguished them as a separate species um, but they since disappeared from there for sort of 25-30 years and everyone was really sad uh, so the uh, 11 farmers in the area got together and they connected up their habitat and put in sort of tussocky margins and within a few years they had hundreds of nest records um, so harvest mouse mice bounced back really soon. There's a picture of a tennis ball there because there was a great idea to try and increase nesting habitat by using old Wimbledon tennis balls with a hole in um, and putting them in vegetation to encourage harvest mice to nest in them. I love the ingenuity of this idea and the fact that they tried and um, Realistically, they weren't very good for breeding nests because they didn't expand as the young mice got bigger. So they weren't big enough to house them for breeding. And for some strange reason, when they were on pastoral land, cows seemed to like to eat them. So it was an unsuccessful uh, intervention, but I like the ingenuity of it anyway.
The door mice, I've mentioned that you need to manage the woodland appropriately. So you don't want to be cutting huge paths and rides without any vegetation going above them because the door mice won't be able to get from one side to the other and they'll rarely run out in the open because they're open to predation. So you want to be managing your woodland appropriately to try and encourage that understory and undergrowth um, and all the different species. Um, so door mice are successional or sequential feeders. So they might wake up in the spring and start feeding on flowers and then move on to caterpillars that are abundant and invertebrates higher in the branches. And then later on in the season, they'll eat berries from the bramble and they'll eat the nuts that we talked about, hazelnuts. So they really need a wide variety and diversity of plants in that woodland that you want to try and be encouraging. Um, and this might mean that you might need to control somewhat controversially deer and squirrel within those woodlands. And again, there are a variety of grants that you can get um, to help you manage your woodlands. And this is something that we particularly do in the Dunsmore Living Landscape. Um, so this is a project that we run at Warwickshire Wildlife Trust um, where um, we work on uh, trying to restore hedgerows. So we manage them as well as plant them. So one thing that you can do is to survey for hedgerows. So um, there's a big initiative at the moment called the Great British Hedgerow Survey that I mentioned um, in the Hedgehog webinar, where you can survey um, your hedgerows to see what state they're in. So you can just go to a hedgerow that's nearby and assess it, look at what species are in it, um, look at whether there are any gaps in it. And this is going to help us to try and um, target hedgerows to restore, to connect up the landscape. Um, so there's loads of information about that on the website here. Um, and it, it kind of tells you how you go about doing that and you can learn some new skills doing that. That's generally best done in the summer when the leaves are on, are on the shrubs. In the winter, you can normally get involved in um, some hedgerow restoration. And again, this is something that runs particularly for the Dunsmore Living Landscape Project, uh, where you can learn to lay hedges, which is a, a technique um, that you use. Uh, to try and regenerate the, the hedge so that it grows from the base upwards. Um, and this is really interesting to get involved in. And um, hopefully um, when measures have sort of um, subsided a bit, uh, there might be some more opportunities for you to, to learn to lay hedges. Um, in Warwickshire, as part of the water bowl restoration project, we put in vegetation at, at bank sides of canals and rivers that had been concreted at the sides. Uh, which serve as water bowl motels, somewhere for them to have a little bit of a feed and to be able to access the banks and travel along them. Uh, in the Isle of Wight, they set up the first ever Dormouse Bridge. Um, so this was over a railway which was disconnecting two sections of woodland. Um, it was a bit of an experiment, but happily they found that Dormouse and a range of other mammals love to use the bridge. And these are now being um, enrolled in different projects around the country. And of course, those hedgehog holes that you can make, as we discussed before, so connecting up the landscape, not only just through hedges and through field margins, um, but also in urban areas by cutting holes in fences so that you make what we call hedgehog highways. And this um, diagram just demonstrates really the connectivity of habitats and how important they are. So don't worry too much, but on the left hand side, we have um, a habitat map, as it's called, of Brandon Marsh. Uh, lots of blue here because it's a very marshy area and these um, purple dots are records of harvest mouse nests and the red one is, is a harvest mouse itself that was found. Um, and on the right here we have a much more urban area, you can see we've got some really quite heavy roads running through this cross here and um, some amenity land, some amenity grass and then pitches, sport pitches. But you can also see the presence of harvest mice here. And really you're looking at the connectivity of these two very different environments. You've got a riverine corridor here on the left and a riverine and woodland corridor here um, around uh, on the right. So both of them are connected in space and that is really key for our small mammals to enable them to disperse and reach new habitats. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I know it's a lot to take in, there's a lot to cover, um, but I tried to give you an overall um, kind of guideline on, on small mammals. Uh, there is of course more information on our project specifically on our website here and there is uh, our next webinar that you can sign up for and um, that's going to be all about birds and um, with expert Ed Druitt so do have a look at that that's next week. Um, but in the meantime now if you do want to stay on there is going to be a question and answer session so thank you very much for listening.
I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen. And come back to you all. Okay, so um, for this one, if you do want to um, unmute yourselves and, and put your video on if you're happy to, to be on camera, um, that's fine. Otherwise, you can just remain muted and maybe you can put some things in the chat. Um, so I'll just have a quick look in the chat, see if anything has come up. Um, mostly thanks. Okay, great. Um, so really, there doesn't have to be a formal format to this. If you've got any questions, just unmute yourself and go for it. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Um, you mentioned about the reinforcement programs of the hazel mouse, and I was wondering how involved the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust were in this, like the monitoring stages or whatnot. Yes. So the um, the reintroduction of hazel dormice to Warwickshire, um, as there's been a big um, reintroduction program, uh, mostly in the last couple of years. Um, so this has been done in some woodlands in Warwickshire and it was led by Warwickshire Wildlife Trust um, but in partnership uh, with um, other organisations such as the PPS that I mentioned, also ZSL, um, Paint and Zoo, there's lots of other organisations that were involved in that. Um, it was a lottery funded project. So now that they've been reintroduced we're now in the stages of monitoring them. So um, I showed the video of checking the boxes um, each summer, uh, once a month. Um, which license holders do along with other volunteers. Um, so at the moment that is being led still by Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. Um, but you can find out more about how to get involved in that through either the Mammal Group, um, if you want to check out their website, or um, through um, contacting the Dunsmore Living Landscape Project at Warwickshire Wildlife Trust, or by messaging me and I'll put you in touch um, with um, you know, either one of those. Um, so the idea is the monitoring will be handed over to Warwickshire Mammal Group in the long term, but at the moment it's still being um, funded and led by Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. Okay. And um, it's very exciting. What year did it start? Um, so oh, I, think, I think the first uh, reintroduction that, that we did, um, there were there are some other um, dormice that were reintroduced many years ago in Warwickshire, but the first one that's sort of recent was done in 2018, um, I think. Okay around about then. The last few years we did one one year and another one the second year in another area of woodland with the idea that they'll okay. meet up eventually and um, with some hedgerow uh, restoration. Yeah no I've just got a big uni assignment on um, translocations right now so it was just interesting to look at one close to home. So. Oh yeah no it's, it's been um, successful we've got we've got breeding young and it's really exciting to be honest to have them back in, in Warwickshire. Um, usually there are a couple of reintroductions every year led by the PTES, um, so they're probably a go-to person to ask about them. Um, I think it was put on hold this year, I'm pretty sure they were put on hold this year because of Covid, um, but the plan is to raise some more funds and do another reintroduction elsewhere next year, bigger and better. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks for the thanks for the talk, Devi. I thought it was really interesting. I was just wondering if you went out um, to try and find some nuts from the mice. Do, are they just on the floor, or is there anywhere to like look for them? Yeah. So. Um... Yes, it, they're just on the floor, basically. Um, so uh, you, I guess you try and find a habitat that you thought looked mousy. So, you know, again, don't be looking at those huge veteran trees with no undergrowth um, because you're not going to find any dormice in those kind of habitats. Um, but you would carefully just kind of go and have a look. Try not to tread everywhere because there will maybe be hibernating dormice and um, so just be very careful where you tread and just have a look and just see if you can find some some nuts on the ground so like i say for, for dormice they just eat a nut where they find it um as they sit on a branch and then just drop it so you'll find them just in ones or twos not very many and um, so it can be it can be like looking for a needle in a haystack um, but it's just, you know, if you happen to be walking in some woodland, you think, oh, this looks dormousy. It's a, it's a nice thing to do at this time of year. Um, and uh, yeah, you might find caches of nuts, like I say. They're quite interesting to look at anyway. You can see how a wood mouse potentially has nibbled it, you know, and have a little look with a hand lens or a magnifier if you've got one. 
and um, for your eyes are good I'm I, I, my eyesight's not too bad close up far away it's rubbish and um, so I can often see the the grooves of the teeth but they'll be in caches for the wood mice oh cool, thank you hi Debbie um I was just going to ask about the uh, the water vole stations. I know that um, the Wildlife Trust puts them in uh, Coventry Canal, and I know they're like, primarily based around like feeding stations. But I wondered if there was anywhere in the projects that were doing sort of like artificial um, burrowing locations, and if there was anything that you could could look up to see if there were any sort of best practice of how wide they'd need to be or how deep or anything like that. Yes, yeah, so there have been some experimental approaches to creating um, water vole burrowing areas. Um, so you can imagine it's quite difficult for water voles to burrow into those concrete um, riverbanks and canal sides. Um, so there have been some attempts to do that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head particular dimensions or anything, but I can always look that up. Um, but there have been some experimental approaches to do so, um, some locally I think as well. Um, but most of it has focused on the sort of feeding and sort of temporary areas for them to be able to get out onto the banks um, rather than the actual burrows. Um, but there's, as far as I'm aware, there are some experimental approaches to creating some uh, where there's not that much vegetation for them to do so. Oh, okay, cool. I'll, I'll have a look into it. <laughs> Thanks. No worries. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed by how much you know. It's amazing. It's just, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but thank you for your talk. Um, I had an in, I had a question about the shrews, and I was just wondering: Do they eat any particular kinds of insects, or are they very generalist and they'll just eat anything? Or do they eat sort of the larvae of insects that are in the soil? Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. As far as I'm aware, they're quite quite generalist and um, they do have those sharp little teeth so they can crunch insects uh, in a similar way to hedgehogs so hedgehogs really like to eat beetles for instance mm -hmm. um, but shrews are quite small so they're not going to take massive you know mm. insects they're not probably not going to go for like a cockchafer for instance and um, so they're going to be within the rounds of the little things that they can take um, but really yeah just just mostly any insects that they can get hold of and um, they tend to eat as far as I'm aware. Although I don't know of any particular dietary shrew studies. I'm sure they're out there. You've made me intrigued now. I might go and uh, look it up and have a look at their dietary studies. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was just interested to see if they would could be used as, I don't know, like in sort of like a way of like controlling pest insects in like farming, but that might be like really out there if uh, that's something that we could do. I would love to see shrews everywhere, you know, <laughs> being used. And um, that would be brilliant. Um, I'm not sure they'd eat enough <laughs> for that to be the case um maybe you could try and try and uh, make it shrewy there's one um meadow that i've regularly surveyed and it is just i call it shrewville because literally i'll set a long web track i'll walk one step and i'll hear the trap go um and it'll be a shrew and it's just impossible to leave because i'm constantly emptying the traps because i don't want to leave the shrews in the traps um, so maybe I should look at, you know, if there's any pest species of insects there and try and do a correlation. That would be interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, hi, Debbie. Oh, hi. Hiya. Um, I know last week with the slugs, you were talking, they were, she was talking about the native species being like ones that were there since the ice age kind of thing is that the same with small mammals or is it a different sort of process yeah so what we class as native uh, often varies from species to species and there are some pretty hazy lines about what's accepted and what's not so for instance harvest mice um actually their origins date back to two to three million years ago in china um, but they are thought to have come over and um, sort of ice age time, the end of the last ice age over to, to Britain. Um, probably they reckon they were introduced um, because actually we had a lot of woodland at that time and it's since been made agricultural and, and beneficial to harvest mice. Um, so 
most people class them as native even though actually most people now think that they were probably introduced but because they've been here for such a long time um, and we're not quite sure we tend to class them as a native species um, so I'd say there's no hard and fast line as to what we would class as native as such um, but it tends to be animals that have been here for really quite some time <laughs> Um, but that does vary and people argue about it. Uh, some people get really passionate about it and saying that some are native and some aren't. If that helps. So Sorry, it's not very in clear, terms but... of the rats, are there any like actually native rat species? or? Uh, so we don't class them as native to Britain here. So um, both our, our rats we class as non-natives, um, okay. which is why I didn't talk about them too much. Um, the, their origins they're fairly certain of, of when and how they came over um, so they're they're not classed as natives um, I, I quite like a rat every now and again I know I know they're not very popular um, but I, I still like to see them <laughs> I just... I, um, oh hi can I just come back to um, Jake's question about the water bowl uh, habitat uh, it was about 10 years ago, Shropshire Mammal Group did uh, a thing whereby we sank bales of, uh, it's, uh, it's called coir, it's like a very loose woven um, coconut matting into the concrete banks or just beside the concrete banks of uh, a canal up near Chirk in northwest Shropshire. And um, I think that was quite effective but I don't think there's been much follow-up work done on it now to, uh, to, you know, to determine whether or not it was successful long-term, but certainly short-term, it was, it was quite effective. Great, thanks Rick. Yeah, um, so some of the, um, the stuff that was put in Warwickshire in the restoration project that was slightly more recent was coir rolls um, from the coconut husks, but there was also other vegetation that was planted as well. And so again, that's, we don't know long-term the impacts of that, um, so it would be interesting to see, you know, if there are some longer term follow ups um, and just how useful they've been. Um, from camera track footage, we know that they have been using them. Um, but how long for or, or how much or how often, you know, is, is another question. Um, but good to know that uh, it's done in Shropshire as well. Uh, was it Becca? Did you have a, another question? Yeah, I was just um, I was going to ask. Is, are there plans to reintroduce beaver to Warwickshire? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I would love to say yes. I want there to be plans to reintroduce beaver. I'd be at the front of the queue to say yes. Um, I would say there are no firm and fast plans now, um, but it's you know incredibly likely that it could happen in the next decade. Um, so it's more and more common now. Cheshire just did a release. I don't know if anyone um, caught up on that. I think I sent a video link around about that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're being released more and more frequently now. Um, and with some careful planning, um, then, you know, the impacts looked at. So for them to be introduced in Warwickshire, a study would need to be undertaken to look at the, the potential impacts and ways that we could mitigate for any potential ill effects. Um, but also how and where we might put them and um, so it would be a little while off yet and um, so I'm not aware there's any hard and fast plans but I'll be front of the queue uh, if there are going to be any I hope so 